Good morning, good day, and welcome to another super episode on the African Brand Academy podcast. Hope your day is going great and you're crushing your brand goals. If you're new to the show, we are thrilled to have you with us. And if you're returning this now, we're so glad you're back. Before we dive into this episode, I want to take a moment to remind you to subscribe and follow the show on your preferred platform. By doing so, you'll be the first to know when a new episode is released and we have more fantastic guests lined up for you. The bigger the show gets, the more we can access a broader guest and a broader audience. I'm so glad to have you here today. So today we'll be talking about client acquisition strategies for B2B brands. And I brought Mr. Robert Yakubo, the sales and marketing coach for this lesson. And um, if you don't know who he is, Mr. Robert is focused on helping organizations, founders and experts drive sales and increase market share using sustainable marketing and sales system. He's a facilitator for the SME Connect a business clinic initiative of First Bank Nigeria aimed at equipping SMEs in Africa with the requisite knowledge and business tools needed to drive efficiency in the day-to-day operation of their business. He's also the co-founder and lead business strategist for Split Digital Solutions, LLC, a company focused on building digital solutions for brands seeking to grow their digital footprint and build profitable digital marketing systems. Good morning, sir. You're welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So I'm so glad to finally have this talk with you. I'm glad to see this for like three months now. <laughs> so before we go, <laughs> can you tell us a bit about your background? How did you get started in marketing and sales? Oh, very interesting. It's quite an interesting one. I studied um, uh, computer science and mathematics. And ever since then, I've been interested in numbers as well as understanding how things work. Okay. Now, my journey through my career led me into marketing started with marketing and that pushed me into understanding the psychology of sale. So I have focused more on studying and understanding how people buy. So the reason why that's important is because that takes you down to the principles that govern sales and how people make decisions to buy. Mm. So rather than focus on the tactics and the strategies, I have had a history of studying the principles that govern marketing and sales. So that led me, I think I've spent about five years doing that. And that's as um, led me to where I am today. How has the journey been? Oh, very interesting. Honestly, studying human psychology is beautiful. Mm. If you understand human psychology, you can influence almost anything you want to do. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it's beautiful. I've seen a lot of sales coach talking about um, understanding the human psychology. Do you feel like it's a prerequisite for the mastering sales and knowing how to sell. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, the truth is the decision to buy is an internal decision. So this word persuasion for me has been largely misunderstood. Mm. Persuasion is about helping people unlock their reason why, not influencing them with yours. Wow. Let me give you an example. Okay. Now, your decision to buy a particular product is in it. In other words, it already exists. Mm. So my job as a good salesman is to ask you questions to help you uncover your why, mm. not try to influence you with mine, right? Mm. When you try to influence people with your own why, the reason why they should buy your product, yeah. what you have just done is that you are probably putting yourself at the risk of not aligning with their why. Mm. And when that happens, what you will notice is sales resistance. Mm, mm. Yeah. And so absolutely, understanding human psychology is at the bedrock of persuasion. Wow. I mean, seriously, I feel like sales is one topic that has different uh, entrance or different understanding too, because I've literally spoken with like three sales coaches this year. And then not for myself, just for the enlightenment, and then I've seen that everybody has their own direction. Like you are the first person that is talking about the psychology and the fact that um, the understanding of persuasion, which now makes me think, yes, it's not about influencing my decision, but also actually, no wonder they say the best salesman, they listen. So you have to listen. Exactly. Mm, mm. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that so much. Mm. So what are some biggest challenges you've seen in the African SME uh, marketplace? What are some challenges you see that they face when it comes to marketing and sales? And in your history, how have you been able to help them overcome these challenges? Okay. So the first and what I would call the predominant challenge I've seen 
both clients I've worked with and generally in Africa is mindset. Okay. Now, most African entrepreneurs start a business to survive, right? Mm-mm. And that tends to limit us in the way we approach business growth, business development, expansion, and all of that. I can tell you for sure that a lot of the things we call small businesses are actually not small businesses if we had a change of perspective. Now, Mm -hmm. for example, let me use an example one of my mentors shared, which is um, Fusi Timbakoyu. Now, he shared about a company in South Africa. They are in line with what we know here in Nigeria as Ajo. So that's what they do. You know, some women coming together and putting monies together. And, you know, at the end of the year, everybody gets something substantial for Christmas. And they've been doing that, I think, since 1994. Now, he shared that the total monies put together by these women, this what we call community, right? Yes. Um, they had put together more money than a renowned South African bank. What? Yes. Yeah. But just because of the mindset, we call ourselves small business. And this affects our perception of the value we bring to the market. This affects how far, what markets we access. So in other words, we are largely not exporting our trade are not exporting our expertise because we still see ourselves as small business. But it doesn't stop there. It also affects how we price our product, yeah. how we price our service, mm. right? So for me, the psychology is one, or the mindset is one core area that I focus on in helping clients because for me, nothing else can change if the mindset of an entrepreneur is still limited because it will affect the ability to command their, their worth It will affect pricing. It will affect marketing itself, how well they are able to put themselves out there. I can tell you that I've met gifted people, gifted and highly experienced people who the only gap between them and who they need to become is the ability to put themselves out there. Yeah. Right. So you could meet an entrepreneur who has been through a childhood where all their ideas were rebuffed by the people they trusted at that time. And so this person now has built a business needing to seek validation from people, right? Mm. And what you notice is for every time the person has a bright idea, they are waiting for someone to validate. And unfortunately for this this kind or this part of the world, we need people who are not just innovative, but can take risks and of course calculated risks. So there's a lot of ways mindset affects business people in this part of the world. And so for me, the first thing is the mindset. Then the second thing, of course, is culture, right? Culture affects how we do things a lot and the results that we get. Uh, I'll give you a a typical example. I worked with a woman once who happens to be a very, very gifted entrepreneur. Now, I say that because she has what I call an eye for opportunity. And so she's able to look at the market and uncover bright opportunity and also take advantage of them. So she worked with me at a point where she wanted to do a launch and everything was all set up. Everything was planned well and all of that. And boom, she had an issue convincing her husband to allow her to put herself out there. What? Right, because she comes. Oh, yes. Yes. It was a very, very interesting situation. So the married woman custom and tradition did not allow her to put herself out there, even though she was very bright. And before she got married, she was already running a side hustle. And then when she mm-hmm. got married, she became more like a consultant. Um, mm-hmm. But unfortunately, culture and some of those things, customs. But it's not just that. It affects us in a lot of ways, in a whole lot of ways. Um, we could also talk about the influence of government policies yeah. um, on business. For example, most people may be saying my sales have dropped, but they may not be able to correlate it with how much the impact of the cashless policy is having on Mm. people's ability to spend. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I was out of my house around 7.30 a.m. to find cash. I spent all of yesterday, and I was only able to access 22,000 there. So between 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m., I was only able to access 2,000 there. And between 11 a.m. and 9 p.m., I was able to access another 20,000 there. So that just puts 
But you would say, okay, how about transfers and all of that? Mm. Now, let me tell you something that happened to the market when you introduce a policy that triggers what we call uncertainty. Yeah. People become hard. So they want to hold onto what they have right now. It happened during NSAS. Yeah. It happened during COVID-19. It's not that there was no money in, in circulation, mm -hmm. but people were holding on to the monies they had yeah. because they did not have any idea when the economy was going to, you know, get back to normalcy. Mm -hmm. um, so someone who is a good student of history and someone who is a good student of the economy will know that it is very easy to understand what happened when you have policies introduced into an economy that sparks uncertainty. People become hoarders. Yeah. So largely that's what is affecting a lot of sales opportunities and a lot of um, businesses today. Some businesses are shutting down, right, and all of that. Some are going on a break and all. So in my honest opinion, number one is mindset. Number two is customs and traditions. And number three is government policy. It's how I can relate to the three of them. And I feel like I need therapy right now, <laughs> especially from the mindset part. Because we make you start you're like, I see you're just talking to me. I'm serious. Like the whole mindset of I wanted to do. I also did computer science, right? But I did software engineering. But the thing there is, when you talk about mindset, I'm an innovative person. So when I told my dad that I wanted to do mechanical engineering when I was in GS3, because I felt like, I feel like I'm going to have an innovative future. So therefore, I need to study something that is in line with that. Come thing culture, which demands that if you're not doing like oil and gas in Port Harcourt, I grew up in Port Harcourt, like you're not really something that I should be proud of or something. He said I should drop mechanical engineering to do petroleum engineering. I kid you not, because I grew up in Port Harcourt. Mm. So like now that affects me later on because I keep second guessing my value. I keep second guessing a lot of things. So it's like I said, wow, you're preaching to the choir. And another thing in the government policy thing is that right now me and my team we are kind of kind of on pause with prospecting because of this hoarding thing so like literally it affects us on a very very large scale yeah. and those are like the three top things yeah. wow i think i need therapy <laughs> how do we fix yes, this <laughs> oh my goodness so okay what what um how is client acquisition different for b2b brands compared to b2c brands like what are some unique things about them or challenges Okay, so the the main difference I would identify would have to do with the buying the buyer's journey. Okay. For B two B brand, mm -hmm. the buyer's journey is seemingly longer than B two C. I'll give you an example. If, for example, I want to buy a car right now, I want to buy a car. The first thing I would begin with is maybe a research on what type of car should I buy, and that would be around my preferences. Maybe I want to buy a car that. Um, it's fuel economical. I want to buy a car that will not, you know, give me issues. I want to buy a car that aligns with my social economic status, right? Mm. Now, I would just do a couple of research, maybe do a Google search or something. Then, worst case scenario, ask a friend mm. about his expert experience with a certain type of car. Once I'm done, I will usually have two options. And then I will now finally make my decision and decide on what kind of car I want to buy. The next step yeah. would now be for me to reach out to find out who can get me that car. And that's it. I've made a decision. But when it comes to B2B, the problem most times is quite a number of people have worked with other brands and they have been born. So if you okay. find a B2B buyer right now, they are kind of what we call the sophisticated buyer. They are quite knowledgeable. They are quite exposed. They have some experience with working with brands. And I'm talking about the solid guys who can really invest uh, your yeah. work. So what you notice is you now need to start from building relationships. First of all, of course, you have to be visible, adding value, building relationship, you know, putting yourself exactly where they go to to have their questions answered. And then from there, you build that relationship. You position your irresistible offer and it takes some time. Right now, what we say as, oh, this person just hit me up in the DM, asked about my service. We had a few chats and boom, the person made a purchase. It's not really true. There's been a process. The person has been studying you. The person has been watching you. And most times the B2B buyers are not exactly like the B2C. B2C, that means customers who are in the retail or something like that. They see a product, they like it. They just go ahead and purchase. B2B mm -hmm. buyers are usually onlookers. They are what I call the ghost buyer. So they can be anywhere. They just keep watching. And then when you trigger the right thing mm. for them, when you have that 
one question answered. They just reach out. Sometimes they may not even reach out. You have to be the one to reach out. So when I talk about B2B prospecting, most times I talk about um, triggering what I call the need. So imagine yourself in a class where someone raises a hand, oh, I have a question, right? Yeah. Um, so the first thing you're usually going to trigger is interest, and they will not necessarily show that they're interested in a comment or not. Well, that's if, of course, you do online. If you're doing offline, you may not necessarily get that, hey, I'm interested in what you're offering, but it will give you some signal, some signal like viewing your content and all of that. It will, it's now based on your ability to decode those things and then follow up on the conversation till you arrive at the sale. Um, so B2B sales or B2B processes are a bit more technical and a bit more lengthy than B2C. Yeah. So that's the core thing. That's quite different. And, and for those who don't understand what I mean by B2B and B2C, B2C is um, business to consumer. So you're selling directly to your consumers. And then B2B is you're selling to businesses. So because on that thing, I feel especially in this um in the digital sphere where you're trying to sell digital products, not like digital products, digital services in Nigeria, there's a lot of educating and um, sales call going on. You have to meet one on one. They have to actually understand why they should invest in any digital transformation or whatsoever people like so how can we overcome these challenges or this difference first like i said is to understand the market you are selling to okay that's where the buyer psychology comes in okay. why are they buying this particular product what exactly are they looking to solve what transformation are they looking to attain um and sometimes we sell products that we have not really understood okay? or services that we have not really understood but I'll give you an example. Someone could come online and say something like, make your first sale online. Mm. Now, such a person may be gifted and experienced, but perhaps this person is just breaking free from the sales barrier of the first sale mm. and maybe has a few clients. That person kind of feels that, okay, this is where I have experience and this is where I have results. And so they focus on that, make your first sale online. And then they have people in their audience who are consistently making, say, a thousand dollars. And suddenly your messaging now is going over their heads. They feel like, okay, I've exceeded or I've passed this stage, right? So this is certainly not for me. So first is understanding what market you want to attract and then aligning your messaging and your positioning with that market. And of course, when I talk about positioning, positioning is broad. It would mean collaborations. It would mean your content strategy. It could mean your authority positioning. It could mean going to where your market congregates and all of that. So positioning is broad. Now, of course, after that, you need to understand how to build offers that people cannot resist. Okay, mm -hmm. And how you build your offers will tie into where you currently are in terms of the way the market perceives you. So we have what we call the... The newbies, if I may call it that, then you have the mid-level experts and then you have the authorities of any industry. Now, depending on where you are, and of course, you have to be honest with your assessment, you will design your marketing and your messaging to capture that so that what seems to be a disadvantage is positioned as a strength. Mm. So I'll give you an example. I was once pitching to a company and they made a statement and they said, we're doing a presentation. It was virtual, of course were pitching for a two thousand dollar offer okay. and it got to a point where the the ceo said something the person said okay so robert everything you have said makes a lot of sense to us however we feel like you are a bit new in the game and we worry that you may not have the experience to handle a project of this magnitude mm. and normally most people would see that as a disadvantage but immediately i already prepared for that kind of objection. So I responded by saying, okay, sir, I appreciate your assessment of our ability to deliver on this project. However, what may seem like an inexperience allows us to focus all our resources and our efforts to make this project work. Yeah. So you are not dealing with a company that has 200 clients to handle. When we take up this project, we're focused on this project until we are able to complete it and deliver on our front. And so you can be rest assured that from top to bottom, everyone on the team is focused on making this thing work. So that's framing. I took a disadvantage and turned it into an advantage. So it's about understanding your market, understand what are the things that could constitute sales resistance and build your offer in such a way that bypasses these things or overcomes these things. Because the best way to sell 
is to block objections and not resolve them. Mm. Just keep hitting us about you. <laughs> block objections, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So like what are some what do you what are your top strategies or tools that B2B brands can use to generate needs and attract new clients? Okay, so the idea is there's something I tell clients and I speak about in my community. Mm. Don't try to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel, right? What does that mean? There's something that has been from time memorial, right? Sometimes the techniques, the tactics, the strategies may change, but the fundamentals stay the same. Okay. I'll give you an example. I equate sales and marketing largely to dating, right? They are very similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. Now, when you meet someone for the first time, and you want to, you see this person as a potential life partner. Let's say you are a gentleman and you want to woo this beautiful lady and you see her as your life partner. Mm. Now, the first thing, of course, you would do is to try to understand what she likes, right? What exactly does she like and all of that. And then you begin to position yourself as what she likes. So you look at who does she associate with, who are her friends. When, and then you could even get close to her friends, ask questions about her try to uncover, okay, what her preference is, where does she spend time? And then you just try to, you try gift, you try acts of, what's this word now? Service. Acts of service, yes. So you try a lot of things just to try to uncover what works for her. Mm. And when you find what works for her, you double down on it, right? Yeah, yeah. You double down on it, you go all in. And it's just a matter of time. Her defenses will start to fall and it's just, it's just the same Thing. So to start with, when it comes to acquiring clients or acquiring leads, the fundamentals are the same. What can you give her to buy time? Let me give you an example. So in dating, it could be you offering dinner or you offering um, a date, right? So let's nothing serious. Let's just talk about work and all of that. So that's the first point, a date. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you're not necessarily pitching her anything. You are spending more time listening to her, understanding her, letting her talk, you know, being interesting right in marketing it's basically what can you do for your prospect to get them interested in you or to get the next date right to get the next date so sometimes it could be you offering a lead magnet okay something valuable that will create the first impression and then after that that lead magnet of course you're going to exchange it for some kind of contact and it's the same thing like asking for the second you ask for the second date, you continue to add value, add value until you get to that point where it's just left for you to pop the question. Hey, I'm interested in you and I'd love to get to know, to know you better and all of that. And so it's very similar to dating. And I strongly feel that one of the reasons why a lot of business owners struggle with clients is because they are not committed to the process. They are only committed to the result. Definitely. So they don't have lead magnets. They don't have anything for the first date. You know, they don't do outreach. They don't do, they don't engage in conversations, you know. So basically, a lot of people just focus on content marketing and hope that somebody reaches out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So content marketing for me is good. But imagine that you are printing billboards all over the city trying to get a lady's attention. Of course, it's not going to work. She would see the billboard, but you have to do something else, you know. To get that second date and all that. So content marketing for me is like printing billboards, right? To communicate why people should work with you. Yes, that's good um, strategies to stay top of mind and all of that. But there are other things you have, to, like reaching out, yeah. right? Like organizing maybe paid events, live events, free events, whatever the case may be. That could have your ideal clients congregate in a place, you know. And by so doing, you share free value or not um, what I call nominal value or nominal payment so someone is not paying full price you are giving it maybe potential discount right for someone to come in just basically to acquire leads so quite a lot of us are coming with clients because we're not focused on the process we're not committed to the process so for me that's how you bypass that resistance Mm. focus on the process build the process if you can delegate or automate some of them so that you're not creating a work prison for yourself but a business that is that is client rich is one that is committed to the process Thank you very much. For us, for our agency, what we do mostly is have this uh, strategy call with our client to know what's working for them, what's not working, how we can we can just offer free advice and help them to probably make a particular decision. And then when they probably want to make that decision, then we are now top of mind and then they can reach out and stuff. So like, I like the analogy of the dating aspect. What's the most unconventional way you've ever closed a B2B client? Okay, this would really interest you. 
So it happened, this was a doctor. We were to build a, a full stack funnel for him. Everything yes. to drive sales for him. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I noticed is that doctors are largely givers, but they don't know how to monetize their expertise. Yes. Especially those who have broad communities online. So true story. I found this gentleman on Instagram and I consumed his content and I felt this guy was just too good. So at the time I said, okay, let me check out some of the products he had. I honestly was checking out to make a purchase, but I wanted to see if this guy was sharing this much value um, for free. Let me see what's inside this paper, um, product. Maybe there's something I'll be interested in because at that time I was a bit invested in understanding more about my health and all of that. So I checked his link in bio. I checked everywhere. And I couldn't find anything but a WhatsApp link that um, led to you maybe booking a session with him. And at the time, he was charging 5,000 naira for an hour, right? What? And I was a bit shocked. Yes, 5,000 naira for an hour. And I was shocked, like, if this guy is, if this guy understands what he's putting out here, cannot be pricing himself this way. So I looked through his entire process reached out on WhatsApp and to my surprise, he had an assistant, of course, but um, everything. So after she went back and forth and, you know, and everything, and then she told me I would pay 5,000 naira into this account, you know, and she would schedule me. And I was like, what? Just the same way you were, <laughs> you were shocked. That's exactly how shocked I was. So I went straight into my phone, went to Canva, set up a presentation. Literally, I did it on my phone, set up a presentation on how we could help him monetize his expertise. And I reached out to him in the DM, right there on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And in about 24 hours, I closed a $2,000 deal. That was the fastest oh. ever. Because it just, it, it felt like I, I was reaching out to him on the exact thing he had been praying about, right? And mm. that came from in your due diligence. If I showed you a spreadsheet we use for profiling, let me give you an example. If I am going to prospect for a business, let's say B2B, and well, we have four weeks to work. You would not believe it, but I will usually spend two weeks profiling, not prospecting, profiling me, right? I would have all types of columns. I want to understand what type of products they are offering, what did they price it at, what type of funnels are they using? I literally go through everything. So when I'm sending out a message, it feels like I've known you for as long as you can imagine. There was a time we reached out to a particular woman. I dug into her so much that I discovered that we went to the same primary school. Oh, she God. was a year ahead of me. Yes. They, these things are online. People don't just do their due diligence. At all. Right? Her name was, I found the CEO. Of course, we didn't know the CEO. I had a technique I used on Google. We run a Google script. I found the CEO, found her LinkedIn profile, went to her Facebook looked through her pictures. I knew where she was living, right? I found where she was living. I found where she went to school, realized that we went to the same school. So that for me was what I used as the first outreach message to break the ice. And she was so excited to be chatting with someone who went to the same primary school as her. So all I referred to was our, our English teacher from secondary school, I mean, from primary school. And immediately I mentioned the name, it resonated and that broke the ice. So the conversation just went smoothly. Um, and we're able to close the deal. So for me, yes, doing that due diligence and understanding that point where it truly starts is for me the most important thing. And that's that doctor's experience was one of the most unconventional way I closed the deal. And the fastest uh, ever. Yeah, the fastest. Wow. I want to say try a lot of things and just see what works. Eh? They really do mean it. Like, oh my goodness. Okay. I feel like I should just stop this episode and just give you guys a link to his book, um, The Big Fish Prospecting Framework. And you should just go and get it and consume it as much as you can because how someone can dig into <laughs> the person of primary school that I, I mean, I'm really not dead. <laughs> I mean, you can already get me. Like, <clears throat> ah, no, no, no. That, that's okay, let, me, let me share this with you, Aaron. Let me share this with you quickly. Mm. Someone sends me a video yeah. of a gentleman um, saying something. And I felt like this face looked familiar. And I wanted to know where did this gentleman get this knowledge from? So I quickly um, ran the video on a particular um, software that I, I have or I have access to. And of course, I didn't get any results from that. But what I now did was I said, okay, 
this name and this face kind of looks familiar. So I went to Facebook and I decided to just go through my connections on Facebook to just see any reason why this face looked familiar. And I found the gentleman. And when I found him, his notes, there was nothing on his bio to tell me where he was. But when I found him, I saw a picture of him where he wore a neck tag and it was so thin. I took that picture and I went and recreated it with AI and upgraded it so that I could see the frames and the pixels clearly. Then I zoomed in and I could see his neck tag carry the word Dillon, right, on his neck tag. That's how I uncovered where he was. Oh my goodness. Oh no. How? <laughs> when you see CIA agent, uh, <laughs> see? Well, okay, yes, I have not of those names. Okay, this person is an undercover CIA agent. <laughs> it's not just a salesman. What is not? So I, I'll give you an example. Now, if you discover a prophet now, most people, this they can they can relate. They discover a prophet and the prophet calls your name, tells you something that only you know, that yeah. you've never told anyone. Of course, you will listen, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same principle. If you find the decision maker, the business and you are able to sound like you've known them for decades oh my goodness that's an odd. it falls flat so that's why it's so important to do your due diligence and get to know this person so even if you decide to call dm this person or you decide to cold email this person it doesn't feel or sound mm. like you're a stranger mm. and this is where people get it wrong with sales calls yeah this is this exactly. is, this is your breakthrough because yes, we, we are taught that yes, make sure you know a bit about um you know the decision maker, at least his name or something. But actually getting to know him, know him, and talk on that uh basis will just remove every resistance, almost every resistance. Like yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh my god, I feel I feel like this is supposed to be paid. <laughs> because I'm just learning so much. Wow, this is too much. Okay, be- let's 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 try and wrap up. Um well, I wanted to ask the metrics that brands should be using to track and measure the success of their prospecting and their client acquisition efforts. Okay, so I would recommend that brands develop metrics for every stage of their buyer journey. Okay. For every stage of their marketing process. Mm. And you develop these metrics based on your own objectives. So if you look at a standard company today, they have a marketing department, they have a sales department, and everybody has their target. If you look at banks today, they have sales department, they also have marketer, right? Marketers are meant to initiate conversation and build interest. The yeah. sales guy get right? So simple. First off, at the top of your funnel, you have to be tracking how much acquisition you are doing, right? How much, how many people who are the exact fit for the kind of persons you want to work with mm-hmm. are entering your funnel, yeah. right? Within a given time. So it could be monthly. It could be weekly, it could be quarterly, whatever you want to track. I feel the shorter the time frame, the better, because you can know what is working and what's not working. So mm. I would advise weekly. So you track how much acquisition weekly, then you break it down. After you do acquisition, you have to also look at how many people are taking the next step in terms of learning about your offers and all of that. So let's say you're using lead magnets. Your lead magnet is meant for acquisition, and then you enter the nurture phase and all of that. And then let's say, for example, you do consultation call. Mm. We have to check how many people are going or transitioning from being in your ecosystem to getting on your on your consultation calls within a month. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you have 200 qualified leads entering your ecosystem every month. Okay. And then you have 50 people going from there to booking your consultation calls every single month. Now, what that means is that you have a deficit of 150 people who you have to keep nurturing, right? Yeah. Now, the mistake people make is they just feel, okay, I need to top it up with, I mean, the 150 people extra or 50 people since I already had 150. No, yeah. you have to start afresh because you have your conversion rate. So it means out of every 200, <clears throat> excuse me, 50 people book your consultation call. And out of every 50, let's say five people decide to work with you. Now, your conversion rate is clear. So you know your conversion rate in terms of appointment booking. You know your conversion rate in terms of um, sales. So if you want to scale as a business now, you start from the top. 
you now decide, okay, we want to expand our lead pool and pull in more qualified leads, and then you go there. Then if you notice that qualified leads are coming in, but they are not booking your appointment, it simply means that maybe your offer at that stage is weak, okay? okay? It could also be technical issues. You may not even know why. So you have to diagnose and see why. So that's why it's good to have a segmented process so that you can track, you can troubleshoot each stage to understand what is not working and what is working. Then once you get to the point of closing, maybe you say you close five out of the 200 people that came into your funnel, you now have to develop what we call a follow-up process where you continue your nurture sequence. So it's like a circle. Those who did not close go back into the nurture funnel where you continue to nurture them. And at some point, if they are right for you and your offer is right for them, they would reach out and they would decide to work with you. So if you asked me, number one, you need to track acquisition. That's the first step. Um, number two, if you do appointments, you also need to track appointment setting. Okay, and then of course you need to track conversion. All right, all right. Track, 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 and monitor. Can you tell us a bit about the Big Fish Prospecting? Okay, Big Fish Prospecting. I designed that framework out of what I would call a desperate need to help people who did not or could not do the conventional, conventional way of acquiring clients at that time. Let me explain. So those of us who came online in the 2016, 2017, 2018, it was a bit easier for us to build communities at that time because number one, there was fewer competition. Um, and at the same time, the technicalities around how algorithms worked and all of that were a bit more favorable. So we built communities, right? And um, at that time, what truly defined who an authority was, was by the size of your influence or the reach of your influence. Okay. Um, now, of course, th that still plays out, but it doesn't have as much impact as it used to have right now. So I stumbled on a woman at that time who had 1,200 followers and was closing $2,000 deep. And I was curious to know how she was doing it. So I paid for one of her programs at the time. I can remember it was about $200 um, for an hour. In fact, it was eventually 45 minutes. And what she gave us in that 45 minutes, I filled about six pages worth of valuable information. That's why I decided to test it for myself. And I tested it for myself using a completely different platform, which was LinkedIn. I was not known on LinkedIn at all at that time. But I tested it out. The reason why I used LinkedIn was I wanted to know if I don't have those followers, so to say, would people still listen to me if I was able to articulate what they needed and I was able to present an offer. And to my amazement, I was able to land clients on LinkedIn where I only just set up my platform and I was not popular. And that led me to define what I call the newbie, the mid-level expert, and the authority. So I decided to do more research and test a couple of things out to understand, okay, as a new newbie, how can you prospect and still land top-level clients, even though you don't have a lot of followers and a lot of case study? And so I came up with a system for that. I also came up with another system for mid-level experts. Mid-level experts, of course, are those who have some traction in their business. They've worked with some clients, but they're not yet the, perceived as the authority. Okay, so is there a way for them to land high-level clients as well? Yes. And so I also applied that, tested it out with a few clients mm. on one-on-one -on -one basis, and then built it into a framework. And then, of course, that's for the authority. The authority just needs to put out case studies and call in people, and people will come. And so when I put out that product, or rather, when I tested it out with a couple of clients I was working with at that time, I was shocked. Um, I can remember quite a number of people like Felix, Kofu, and all of that. They literally were closing $800 deals, $1,000 deals, and all. So that led me to now turn that framework into a guide because I just realized that I couldn't help that many people directly, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just one person. So I put it a guide and published it as the Big Fish Prospecting Framework. And since then, quite a number of people have used it, closed, amazing deal. In fact, some testimonials I don't share. Um, for example, a lady who closed a six-month contract of $50,000 using that framework. I don't share that because it would be hard for at this level to accept that that actually happened, right? But it, it happened, and that has been one of my most proud or one of the works that has made me most proud 
um, the big fish prospect. So I'm going to drop a link to, to that framework in the description. Um, but I used to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Oh yes, I, I still take on one-on-one -on -one clients, although I don't make it public. And the reason why I don't make it public is because I'm very picky on who I work with. First of all, his seller store is going to be in the description. So he has a lot of books and um, resources that you can use. There is the launch roadmap for, for turning your expertise to digital products and launching them correctly. There's the necessity offers, how to get folks to buy your um, 1K to 3K offers. There's the magnetic uh, content toolkit and there's the big fish prospecting. You say you choose your coaching clients carefully. Yeah. Like, how right. do you mean? Okay, so you remember when I started, I mentioned mindset, right? Yeah. Um, mindset is something I look out for in law. I'll give you an example. I've had people pay me $1,000 for coaching and never show up. I followed up for two, two years. Two years? Yes. Yes. And... They did not show up, okay? And I'm not talking about, I'm saying till today. <laughs> They've not shown up. Did you refund? Now, of course, my contract suggests that the investment was non-refundable as long as the project has started. Okay. okay? Now, in the particular case, I reached out. The project started. We, we had, of course, the onboarding session, and then we had one extra session. And that was it. In fact, I asked for the person to send me, if the person was so busy, send me someone who maybe like an assistant who could take up this role. I'll train the person and the person will be able to deliver for you. Mm. That was still a problem, right? So it got to a point where I had to ask to do a refund. And because for me, my conscience was not just sitting well. I asked to do a refund and the person still did not respond, yeah. right? I asked twice, the person still did not respond. So, but that's just one. There are a couple of other things where, for example, I have worked with a lady, let me not say a lady, I've worked with a client before where this person had so much potential, but found it very difficult to put herself out there, right? So one of my solid strategies is going live, right? I believe so much in that thing. People don't realize how overrated, I mean, underrated going live is, mm. right? So... It's part of my framework, um, but I couldn't get her to do that. I couldn't get her to share her face, for example, on her profile. Like, it was just flyers, flyers, flyers. Mm -hmm. And so there are a couple of things that, that may just be the basic, right? There are a couple of things I look out for, a couple of questions I ask um, before I take up a client. Not necessarily because I just choose to be picky, but what's more important for me mm -hmm. is not beyond the money people invest, What's more important for me is that at the end of working with me, I'm able to look back and say, okay, I was able to work with this person and this person went from A to B in terms of result. That for me is a better reward than any investment. Of course, the investment helps to get people committed and all of that. And of course, your time should be, there should be some value on your time. Um, nevertheless, for me, there are a lot of things people are dealing with that they themselves do not even realize that they're dealing with. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mindset coach. So when I find someone who is struggling with those things, I rather refer them and take them up as a client. Okay, that's good. So, okay, before we go, how can we connect and work with you? Okay, so I'm most active on Instagram. Anybody who wants to learn about the work I do, of course, Instagram is the place to go. LinkedIn as well. Um, however, anyone interested in working with me can send me a direct email to roberts at robertyakubu.co or robertsyakubu at gmail.com. Mm. Um, otherwise, then there's a link in my bio on Instagram that says work with me. So there, anyone can apply to work with me. And of course, we'll have a session to discuss. I call it the discovery session to discuss and see if I'm the right fit for such a brand or a business. And then if so, then we can discuss how we can work together. Great. Thank you so much. It's been phenomenal. Thank you for being here today. So make sure to check him out on Instagram. His website will also be linked in the description. And the link to the Big Fish Perspective Framework will also be there. And I'm really, really grateful. Have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. And to all of our listeners, I want to say a very big thank you for tuning in and being a part of the community. To keep grinding, keep pushing, keep growing your brand. As always, we'll be here with you at every step of the way. Make sure to join our communities on Facebook and Instagram. 
and don't forget to subscribe rate review us on your favorite podcast platform if you have a question pertaining to branding or business development you can email us at africanbrandacademy at gmail.com or message us on any of the social media platforms or social media communities and i will be able to answer you on the next episode it could be your question and even if i'm not able to answer you here directly i'd make sure to answer you in the communities and this is your own saying ciao take care